to the What Bitcoin Did podcast. Hi there, how are you all? Welcome to the What Bitcoin Did podcast, which is brought to you by Kraken. I'm your host, Peter McCormack, and today I've got a bonus show, a live episode of What Bitcoin Did, which was recorded at the Oslo Freedom Forum, where I hosted a panel discussing Bitcoin usage around the world. But before that, I do have a very quick message from each of my show sponsors. So firstly, BlockFi. They are creating the future of Bitcoin and financial services. You can earn interest on your crypto with their interest accounts, and you can also borrow against your crypto holdings. If you're interested in trying this out, I recommend you do your own research and then head over to BlockFi.com, which is B-L-O-C-K-F-I.com. Also, Dropbit, the best Bitcoin wallet I've used. Dropbit is like a Venmo for Bitcoin, and you can even text Bitcoin to your friends using a mobile phone number. It's available on iPhone and Android. Just head over to dropbit.app, which is D-R-O-P-B-I-T dot app. My new sponsor, Acquinting, your crypto tax tool and portfolio management solution. It's the easiest way to track your trading and optimize your portfolio management. And they are the best price tax reporting tool in the market. To find out more, head over to acquinting.com, which is A-C-C-O-I-N-T-I-N-G dot com. And lastly, Kraken, the best exchange for buying and selling Bitcoin, the only place I use to buy and sell Bitcoin. They support simple buying for new traders and have advanced tools for more experienced traders, including margin and futures trading. If you want to join me in supporting Kraken, head over to kraken.com, which is K-R-A-K-E-N.com. Okay, so on to this special show, which was recorded at the Oslo Freedom Forum, discussing the use of Bitcoin around the world in countries like Iran, India, Nigeria, China, Hong Kong, and the Philippines. And also a massive thanks to Alex Gladstein for his invite to the forum and allow me to host this very important panel. I hope you enjoy it. If you've got any questions about it, do feel free to reach out to me. My email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. Okay, so... We've got an amazing panel here. I'll introduce myself first. My name's Peter McCormack. I'm the host of the What Bitcoin Did podcast, which is a podcast that focuses primarily on Bitcoin. Sometimes it's very easy with Bitcoin to spend a lot of time focusing on people who've made a lot of money and speculation and opportunity. But Bitcoin is a very important tool for freedom and human rights around the world. And we're very lucky to have this amazing panel today. I did mention on my podcast I'd be hosting this session and I don't think I pronounced the single name correctly. So I'm, rather than introducing them myself, I'm going to let each person introduce themselves, what they do, the geography they cover, and why Bitcoin is important for freedom and human rights. So my name is Masa Ali Murdani. I work for a human rights organization based in London called Article 19, uh, leading their internet freedom projects on Iran. And I also do my doctoral research at the University of Oxford on how uh, technology is used for social and political movements in Iran. And increasingly, uh, the issue of currency has become an issue of digital rights in Iran. Hi everyone, Uh, my name is Luis Buenaventura. I'm from Manila, the Philippines, um, which as the crow flies is way too far from here. Um, uh, I've been in Bitcoin since 2014, primarily kind of focusing on the the problem of uh, remittances and money transfer for the 10 million migrant Filipinos that are kind of scattered all around the world. Uh, My name is Timmy Ajiboye and I'm a co-founder of uh, Cryptocurrency Exchange. Um, I'm from Nigeria, and that's primarily where um, my exchange operates. I'm Leo. I'm based in Hong Kong. Um, I would argue that Bitcoin is incredibly important in in Asia specifically on a micro level, um, because as the world increasingly becomes uh, online, as we communicate more online, as commerce becomes online, um, people are uh, a vast majority of the people are completely cut off from that um, because the existing financial system doesn't allow them to participate and doesn't give them the ability to um, offer their products and services online in the same way as it would us in in Europe or us in the United States. Um, but I think there's also an interesting like geopolitical angle to that, and that the world's finance is very much built on on trust, and that trust largely lies in New York, uh, and that trust has been uh, eroding over the last few years. Hey everyone, my name is Aparna. I'm the co-founder and CTO of Open, a decentralized margin trading platform. Um, I've been doing a field study in India to understand the scope of cryptocurrencies as means of payments. Um, the reason I think Bitcoin is really important is think of how easy it is for you to send an email to someone around the world today. And think of how easy or hard it is for you to do the same 
with sending someone a payment. Bitcoin is the kind of infrastructure that needs to exist for that ease of payments to exist. Okay, great. If you hold the mic, we'll go back up and down. So just a couple of questions first, just to get, uh, I just kind of want to gauge the audience here. Uh, don't be shy. Could you just raise your hand if you've not heard of Bitcoin? Isn't that amazing? <laughs> We're now at a stage where everyone has kind of heard of Bitcoin. Now, can you raise your hand if you own Bitcoin? Okay. Okay, so we obviously... Yeah. No, but we can see how far this has come. I don't know why that sparked a debate. Um, but silence again. This is what's very interesting now about Bitcoin. We have now a room full of people where not a single person raised their hand and said they've not heard of it. And I would estimate 40% raised your hands and said you own some, which is very important. Could you put your hand up if you own any Bitcoin cash? Okay. So just so you're aware, you do not own Bitcoin. <laughs> okay. So I think what would be helpful, though, as you guys are on the ground, you're deeply involved in the world of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, what are the, some of the biggest myths that are perpetuated about Bitcoin right now? What do people not understand? Uh, key storage. I think one thing that's really hard right now, especially in India, is um, so the Reserve Bank of India came out with a ban that prevents all RBI regulated entities from offering services to any individual or business doing um, operating in the crypto space. This makes it really hard for any exchanges to operate or exist. Um, this also means that you you have this problem of really hard user interfaces um, that people have to deal with. Um, so the best option that people have right now is something like local Bitcoins. Uh, the biggest myth that I constantly come around, uh, and it's usually from different groups of people with their own interests, is that A, um, Bitcoin is perfectly transparent and everybody can see what you're doing all the time. Uh, and B, Bitcoin is private and it's anonymous uh, dark web money uh, and nobody can like trace anything. I think where I'm from, the thing that stumps people the most is where is the value from? They don't seem to understand why or what the value is based on, right? And I always try to explain it's just uh, as valuable as whatever, whoever will pay for it, but people don't, don't seem to be able to understand that that's how money generally works, right? Uh, I think that would be the biggest like mental barrier to crypto that people face where I'm from. Speed round. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I would say that um, the, the biggest myth that I, that, um, that I see is that you have to actually understand how Bitcoin works in order to benefit from its, from its properties. And uh, the, the, the premise of my business, uh, it's a company called Bloom, is that that's not true. That, uh, that we can use Bitcoin in a way that um, hides it from the, the end user. Um, such that they still f get, you know, the, the the speed of the transaction, the the reliability of the transaction, the security, all of that stuff, without necessarily knowing that it was Bitcoin underneath it. And I can kind of go into the details later, but that's kind of the main thing that we've been trying to build since uh, 2015, uh, where you know, like, we want to be able to create a product that is Bitcoin powered, but people don't know that it's Bitcoin powered. So in the context of Iran, which is very specific as it's going through a currency crisis and the real is getting devalued every day, the main issue is between how the government is trying to control this space, the Iranian government, and how foreign governments want to control this space. So often with Iranian users who want to go and buy Bitcoin, they're often worried that the government might find out that they're transferring money from their Iranian bank accounts at, through the Bitcoin exchanges, and if they'll get penalized through that way, because Iran has a very unclear policy right now on whether or not they are accepting and okay with it. Just three, four days ago, they unblocked uh, Bitcoin exchanges. It, it was blocked for a year since April 2018. On the other hand, there's the issue of US financial sanctions against Iran, and so we're seeing, I mean, this past week we saw the first example of local Bitcoin actually blocking Iranian users. 
Um, I mean, I'm really excited to hear what they're going to say about the reason because there hasn't been an official statement. But we're assuming for US financial sanctions, they blocked Iranian users. And so understanding what kind of financial accountability there is in terms of how the world financial systems work in terms of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency is um, something I haven't quite understood myself, but it's stopping Iranians, I guess, from fully getting into this uh, arena. What I found with Bitcoin when I try to explain it to my friends is trying to help them understand why they should take an interest in it and why they should care about it. And in doing the podcast, I've met many different people who have many different use cases, and that all depends on life circumstances and geography as such. My personal use case is I have clients in America. I'm based just outside of London, and it's cheaper for me to invoice in Bitcoin, sell on a local exchange, and transfer to my bank account because I only pay the exchange fee, whereas if I'm paid bank to bank, I pay a 3.2% fee above the exchange rate. So on, say, you know, say it was $10,000, it's going to save me a few hundred dollars. So that for me is a personal use case and a benefit. Can you guys talk about in the specific geographies that you work in, the different use cases that people have? Um, I mean, in my specific issue, uh, personal story, uh, someone in my family is in the hospital right now with stage four cancer, and they're having a very hard time paying for their hospital bills. So um, my partner, who actually does have Bitcoin, has been transferring money to Iran through this method. So in this term, when the currency is being devalued and someone's salary is almost becoming nothing on a month to month basis and someone's lifetime savings is paying for four days in the hospital, this is becoming a very valuable way to transfer money across borders and to create to maintain wealth when this other um, form of maintaining wealth is being eroded. Can you also before you answer, explain to people why, because some people might understand censorship resistance. Can you explain that before you answer as well? Um, censorship resistance in Bitcoin? Yes. Um, do you want to take that, Leo? Or Like, sure. you've got a better joke, I think. <laughs> For Bitcoin to be valuable, it must not be by, controlled by anybody. For Bitcoin to be valuable, it must be accessible to everybody. And we know that governments... Um, uh, China, Iran, um, the United States, India, they all have their own ways of controlling the internet, of mandating that certain laws are being followed. And some of these laws can make finance unavailable, right? If you don't have a proof of address, um, because for example, your bank account is in, uh, your, your home address is in your husband's name, then you might not be able to get a bank account. Um, and so these, these, so for Bitcoin to maintain censorship resistance, um, it needs to be able to essentially ignore the law of the land. And it needs to be able to ignore and, and be capable of circumventing um, any of the tools that the state has to make apps unavailable, to make websites unavailable, um, or to essentially stop you from communicating. Uh, okay, so the way that we're using Bitcoin right now is, um, and I'll go back a little bit because you, you need a little bit of context. So there's about 10 million Filipinos that currently live outside of the Philippines. That's about, the numbers are pretty easy to remember. It's about 10% of our entire population is living outside of the Philippines. And every year they'll send back home about $30 billion in, in personal remittances, which accounts for about 12% of our GDP. So fairly big chunk of the economy kind of relies on this. Now, on average, they'll spend about 7.5% uh, sending that money back, right? So it, almost a, a billion dollars in fees. Now, uh, when we first discovered Bitcoin, uh, I mean, my, my co-founders and I, uh, several years ago, we, we saw it as a value transfer mechanism first and foremost. We weren't so interested in the store of value part. We were more interested in the fact that you could send money in theory, as quickly as you could send an email, if an email takes 10 minutes. Now, anyway, so that was kind of the premise, right? And we thought, okay, so if we could use Bitcoin as a vehicle for remittances, then maybe there's some way that we could drop those fees. 7.5% is an incredibly high ceiling, right? So um, anything lower than that is already fairly significant. Um, we piloted this idea in South Korea in 2015 um, and we were able to kind of get the costs of your average $100 remittance to about uh, 3%. So that's about 50% savings on average. So um, it was fairly successful. Obviously, the Filipino community there really liked it because they were saving money. And by the end of um, that year, 
we had, we had somehow grown to nearly 20% of all of the personal remittances uh, that was going from South Korea to Philippines. Now, it only lasted for about a year where we were kind of running all of this volume uh, via the Bitcoin blockchain. And we were certainly very proud of it, but you know, eventually the regulations in South Korea caught up to us. Um, because if you're familiar with you know, kind of the, the way that uh, regulation in South Korea looks, it, they kind of tend to relegate all of this stuff to um, kind of unlicensed uh, activities. So we could no longer risk um, kind of doing these transactions, even though we knew for a fact that there was not a single one of them that was uh, illegal or, or you know, kind of none of them were funding terrorism. I mean, if you're, sending, if you're trying to finance terrorism, $100 per transaction, you're really doing it wrong. So um, that was clearly not what was happening there. But because of the kind of um, the, the harder stance that the Korean government was beginning to take on this sort of thing, uh, we decided it was you know, probably a good idea to put a pause on it. Now, we haven't revisited that, but we, we now do volume from Hong Kong to the Philippines and Australia to the Philippines and some other smaller pockets of the Filipino diaspora across the world. Um, and we've managed to do that for you know, the last couple of years. Uh, we've moved a little over $200 million in remittances since we started this company. So, you know, again, pretty small if you look at it comparatively to the $30 billion that are kind of being reported, but you know, it's a start. Um, so uh, most of the, I guess, daily users on my exchange are people who actually trade for a living, right? And um, Nigerians are very enterprising, I'm, I'm sure as you know, and we always find ways to make money that aren't necessarily conventional. So Niger <laughs> um, one of we're very uh, eager and you know excited to get into Bitcoin, right? But the difference between how Nigerians trade crypto isn't so much um, speculative, like the price is up now, I buy and blah, blah, blah. It's actually part of a much larger remittance uh, flow of money, right? And it's very similar to his case where um, Nigerians are everywhere and we send about $25 billion back home. Um, there's also a bunch of uh, Nigerians outside Nigeria, schooling in the US and everywhere in the world, and parents need to figure out how to pay fees, right? Even though um, getting access to USD is difficult. And there's also a lot of trade between Nigeria and China. Um, there's a lot of importation. So these, these traders, these people who trade every day are like offering um, remittance services saying, you know what, give me uh, X million Naira and I will get it to your guy in China at this exchange rate. And what they do is they buy and sell and try to match like uh, people who are looking for Bitcoin, people looking for Naira, or people looking for Yen. And that is um, pretty much every day now, we do about $150,000 of this trading, right? And, and it's still very niche. Um, we're finding that people are looking for more, um, I guess, specialized services like the school fees thing. How can we make it such that the Traders aren't the ones offering the service, but we are the ones taking Naira and essentially getting it as close to the schools as possible. So that's pretty much how uh, Bitcoin and I guess some of the altcoins are being used um, in Nigeria. The, the answer to that question is often the answer to the question, who doesn't have access to a traditional finance? Um, or in what circumstances um, can you not make a cash um, payment? And luckily, Hong Kong is quite well connected to the international financial world. Um, so the, the way that Hong Kongers would use Bitcoin um, frequently, that might be um, somebody in high school who finds it easier to go to a Bitcoin ATM and buy video games online rather than asking the parents to borrow their credit card. Um, or it might be a traveler who coming, who's coming through Hong Kong, um, but whose uh, debit card is, is not working at the machines or who just doesn't have access or just doesn't feel comfortable carrying around the 50,000 US, 50, US dollars in cash that they might need um, to buy the products that they want on the Hong Kong markets. Um, when we look across the, the, the still existing border to China, um, we have suddenly um, hundreds of millions of, of, of traders, of producers, um, of merchants who 
don't, who are not connected to um, the global um, financial world. And especially small independent shops um, might find it hard to make international wire transfers. Um, the currency, so every Chinese citizen has a um, 50,000 US dollar per year limit on how much they can send out of the country without asking, without answering additional questions. And 50,000 US dollars um, that might um, not, it's definitely not enough for somebody who has their kid in, in a school in Europe or the US. It's definitely not enough um, for somebody who regularly trades um, with the emerging economies of um, Western, Eastern Africa, uh, Bangladesh, Pakistan, um, Indonesia, um, where we see a lot of the, a lot of the growth opportunities in, yeah, People need uh, mobile phones. People need um, SIM card. Uh, people need like uh, SD cards. Uh, people need clothes. Um, there's a lot of like really growing trade that's being. Um, these opportunities are mainly, take, mainly taken by small independent traders who find it really hard to go to the local bank and supply all the required documents um, that allow them to like make that outgoing wire transfer to prove that whatever product they're, they're sourcing from these countries is really like legitimately bought and not as the government fears um, somebody escaping um, capital controls um, and I think Bitcoin does not always um, work um, perfectly for this um, but it does um, it does cut um, short a couple of really difficult um, paths, um, really difficult barriers that the government or banks um, put in your way. Um, and eventually, as people pick these up, um, it starts to go both ways. It starts to um, be people who regularly travel to China to source whatever materials and whatever goods they might need, um, finding it more convenient to, um, they don't have access to um, Alipay or WeChat or local wire transfers, but they will have a guy who they know from online and who they don't need to fully trust because they're able to cheaply do escrow and they can, using their business associate in Kenya, easily source 10,000, 50,000 US dollars, make that Bitcoin transfer to the guy in China who will then use their personal um, Alipay, WeChat account, wire transfer account um, to send the money to whoever's selling um, computers, whoever's selling um, accessories or clothing. Um, and that works relatively well in practice. Um, it might not always work very well in theory because we do know there are significant other steps, but um, it does help people uh, conduct business and does help people make money uh, and eventually yeah, pay for, pay for their food that gets on their family's table. So in India, similar to Philippines, a large number of people uh, leave the country to work outside. Um, so one very common use case is remittances, cross-border payments, um, or just sending money back, <laughs> sending money abroad. Um, so I remember this one story of a parent who told me he had to set up a bank account in Singapore because he's not allowed to hold a large number of US dollars um, in India. And so through the year, he sends some amount of Indian rupee into the Singapore account to save up for his daughter's education. And every time the, uh, the, in, uh, the foreign exchange rate between the Indian rupee and the dollar seems good, he has to send money to this bank account and then transfer money from that bank account in Singapore to uh, US. Now, uh, what he decided to try was using Bitcoin and he realized that the process was so much easier for him than doing this multi-stage bank setup. Um, so this is one example where people in India use, use uh, Bitcoin. Another case is contracting. Um, so I talked to the student who talked about how he accepted payments in Bitcoin to save up for his education. <laughs> Um, and that's how he paid for all of college. Um, so these are the two main use cases that I've seen so far. Thank you. Could you also, with each of your geographical regions, and Leo, probably more China, less so Hong Kong, can you explain the current state of regulation in each country and the impact that's had on people using Bitcoin and the way it's changed how they maybe use Bitcoin? Yeah, so... In India, the Reserve Bank of India decided to ban use of cryptocurrencies, partly because they don't understand 
what cryptocurrency is and they they don't know how to craft good regulation around it and they've been waiting for other countries to craft it and see how that works before they come up with their own set of regulations around it um, but what this has essentially done is created almost a negative propaganda so if you walk into a store um, somewhere here and you tried to buy a pack of cigarettes, you might see something like, oh, this is what smoking does to your lungs. Um, in a similar manner, in India, if you walk into an ATM, you have all these signs flashing at you telling you Bitcoin is a scam, uh, cryptocurrencies are bad for you. Um, and it's almost a propaganda run by the government against cryptocurrencies. This has made it really hard for one, it's obviously made it very hard for exchanges or any businesses in the crypto space to operate. Two, it's also made it hard for people who already own these cryptos because one, they're in this odd position where they can't sell their crypto because if they do, they can't buy it back. Um, so in the case of volatility, what do they do? They're in this weird middle ground where they, they just have to hold on um, and everyone thinks they're scammers for holding crypto. The legal situation of Bitcoin in China is very difficult uh, because there, isn't, there aren't clear rules. Um, there aren't clear regulations that tell us exactly what the status is currently and how the status might be changing. Uh, but we can very much observe um, how the government and how various departments are currently enforcing um, their, their rules, um, how they're currently interpreting existing rules um, that might change over time, that might sometimes be influenced heavily by um, certain announcements that do not have legal status. Um, so that might sometimes be influenced a lot more by um, practical actions in 2017 in August suddenly um, all Chinese Bitcoin exchanges would shut down and there wouldn't be really like a law that explained us why that would be but by observing that all these exchanges shut down we can very much now assume that running a Bitcoin exchange in China is illegal at the same time um, that the the nature of Bitcoin exchanges in China has changed a lot over the years um, where today a lot of the tr exchanges um, are um, simply platforms messaging platforms online where people find each other to trade peer-to-peer -peer, and where the platform only acts acts as an escrow agent and only acts as a as sort of a, a trust um, review platform where people give each other's um, positive and negative feedback and where people report on whether like uh, a certain agent accepts Alipay or, or WeChat or not. Um, and in China, people have this tendency. Um, so this is not unique to Bitcoin. A lot of laws in China function like this. A lot of commerce function like this. So people have the tendency to, to push the, the barrier a little bit to always um, try a little bit more and, and see if they're getting smacked down. And if they're not, then they're going to try a little bit more. Um, and so we have over the last, I think since 2013 is the first time Bitcoin really got onto the, um, onto the um, like eyes of the government where it really gained attention for the first time. And we've seen people pushing that line forward and the government smacking things down and people pushing it again. And a lot of these things um, seem to more have to do with controlling the narrative of we, the Chinese government doesn't want you to think, they don't want their citizens to think, and they definitely do not want the international media to report that there's something inside of China that they don't control. And they very much want us all to know that they control everything, every little thing, and that they even have insights into every little Bitcoin transaction you make, and that encryption is completely useless. Um, and um, partly... They, they may let it slide um, because they aren't able to fully control it. They may let it slide um, because, they, um, because it's so small that they haven't yet made their mind up about it. But they also may let it slide um, because they simply don't believe in it and simply um, think this is, this is going to go away by itself and so it doesn't really deserve attention. Um, so yeah, a lot of this is our speculation. This is our observation. Uh, but um, I am very confident that Bitcoin is very well and alive in China um, and that it's relatively accessible to people with a mobile phone, which is almost everybody. Um, so the government in Nigeria and most of Africa, actually, they've mostly not said anything. Um, there's like a um, negative sentiment because how most Nigerians started hearing of and I guess using Bitcoin um, was uh, there was this very popular Ponzi scheme a few years ago called MMM and um, Nigerians respond to things that are supposed to double your money without any explanation so, so if you want to if you want to 
get Nigerians interested, just tell them you've doubled their money without explaining how. And <laughs> there are so many, and, and I guess it makes sense considering where most of the uh, country is in terms of their like um, hierarchy of needs, right? Um, so what happened was a lot of people got scammed and a lot of them got scammed because they sent the money to this scheme with uh, Bitcoin, right? And so the government um, has forbidden banks to hold any crypto and there's this memo which some banks have interpreted to mean that you can't work with exchanges. So I've had bank accounts be shut down for no reason. Uh, but there's no like actual law or um, regulation. And I think a large part of that is due to a complete lack of understanding of how this works and what it is actually. Uh, there's also a part of me that suspects that there's hands-off behavior because um, there's some money laundering happening with crypto and Nigerian politicians love that. Um, uh, yeah, they make them feel good. They <laughs> yeah, um, but I, I think because we're so enterprising and because of exchanges like mine and other startups I'm seeing like um, coming out there, becoming popular, and seeming like they're dedicated to doing the right thing. Uh, I think we're, because for one, I've been allowed to exist for two years now, and I'm constantly being reached out to by some people that might have an effect on, you know, what the compliance laws will look like. And, you know, it's it's a bit, um, it's like, oh, yeah. So I, I think we'll be, we'll be, we're going in the right direction. I think, um, I, I, I'm not afraid that, uh, in a few years from now, there'll be some law saying, you know, there's no trading or exchanges are not allowed in Nigeria. I think will be very well uh, present and available. Yeah. Uh, so it's not very often that I can say that the Philippines is kind of at the forefront of anything. Uh, so I'm just gonna like, you know, humble brag now. Um, so we are one of the handful of countries that have licensing for cryptocurrency companies. Uh, my, my company is one of those uh, license holders uh, is called the virtual currency exchange license um, as far as I know we've issued 10 of those licenses so far so um, you know companies from all over the world are coming to the Philippines to get their licensing um, to be able to say that they've got that piece of paper right which is important in some scenarios and not so important in others now it's at the point where uh, the eighth largest commercial bank in the Philippines uh, is working directly with Consensus, the, the Ethereum guys, um, to create a um, kind of interba interbank fund transfer network uh, on top of Ethereum. Like they're kind of at that level of, of um, integration. Um, that same bank has a, I kid you not, a Bitcoin ATM in their flagship store, right? So, you know, banks and blockchains, man, wow, who'd have thought? Now, um, that sounds weird, but at the same time, I, I think that it brings a lot of this stuff to the light, which is, it's been in the dark for very long, right? And we've been working kind of in this weird shadowy gray area for, you know, the first five, six years of Bitcoin's life. And I think that where we are right now, there are more and more of these very legitimate large companies that are kind of throwing around uh, words like cryptocurrency and blockchain. And, you know, I mean, granted, some of it's hype and some of it's just like, you know, virtue signaling, but um, there is... Uh, uh, definite kind of, uh, I guess, a growing uh, sense that this stuff is for real and it's for it's actually going to stick around, and I think that's very important. Um, it certainly helps me because when I go out into the world and I speak to, so I don't usually speak in uh, crypto conferences or blockchain conferences. I usually speak in remittance conferences, right? And the first few years where I was doing that, I was just that weird guy in the corner who kept talking about Bitcoin. Um, and now it's more like, you know, these remittance companies are coming to us to receive that very important, or so they think, blockchain education, which to me is great. These are warm leads and now I don't, and I don't have to like batter down their doors to, to try to get meetings with them. Now they're actually coming to us. So, so it's, a, it's a fairly big advantage and we're, we're seeing this, this sea change kind of happen very unsexily in the in boardrooms and you know meeting rooms and stuff like that it's not exactly the revolution we were expecting but i think that again it's it's a it's a major starting point because things are no longer as uh, gray or shadowy as they used to be so. 
So, Massa, you've already answered about the regulatory framework in Iran. So I've got a different question for you because obviously Iran is considering creating, the government's considering creating their own cryptocurrency. And for any of us who understand Bitcoin, realize how ridiculous that is. But what is the actual status of this project? So with Iran and just its general look at Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, that they're struggling to do two things, which is uh, maintain international trade, um, while circumventing U.S. financial sanctions, and at the same time, creating value in their own currency, the real, which at the moment stands, every U.S. dollar is 122,000 real. Um, and if you Google that number right now, you're going to get about 44,000. That's wrong, because the government um, gives itself more value than it actually is. So you have to kind of do s research in the Persian language to find the accurate um, value. Um, so they're doing these two things, and obviously the methods that Iranians are using to maintain their wealth is buying gold, buying U.S. dollars, which can be quite hard through the black market, and cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, and this does not help strengthen the real. And so they are, were started toying with the idea of creating their own cryptocurrency, and I think one of the only precedents of this was in Venezuela, and it was a huge fail. And so, I, I mean, I don't know this um, the technology that well, so, but I don't know how this can work through fiat, and I don't think it will work in Iran. And as soon as they announced this, they also did a bunch of different things. They blocked Telegram, because Telegram announced its own cryptocurrency. So Telegram, if you know anything about Iran, it's, it's the internet in Iran. And so it got blocked, and the main reason we found out later was because they were releasing their cryptocurrency, and Iran is also trying to develop this. now. Um, like much of the projects that happen in Iran, there's so much economic mismanagement that um, this project will, I mean, beyond the fact that it contradicts the terms, it will likely never come to fruition because um, these projects are often ha hard to come about uh, to begin with in that kind of um, government management system. So that's happening with the cryptocurrency state. And I think, uh, like I said before, Iran is generally confused with how to deal with Bitcoin in general. So it keeps on flip-flopping between blocking them, not blocking them. This obviously doesn't really affect people who are in this community because if you are buying cryptocurrency and if you're exchanging it, you know how to circumvent the blocks and you know how to go around it. And in general, Iranians are quite savvy with circumventing things. They've been circumventing sanctions since the 80s. So um, if they want to get to crypto, which is getting even more popular by day by day. They're going to get to it. So if you're in Tehran right now, you're in a taxi cab, your taxi driver is probably talking to you about Bitcoin and managing their wealth through Bitcoin right now. So it's out of the government's hands a bit. So nation state cryptos are generally quite unhelpful for the growth of Bitcoin. You will see upstairs, as, uh, sorry, in the other building as part of the exhibition hall, the Open Money Initiative by Jill Carlson, Alejandro Macedo, and Jamal Montserrat. I I think that's their names. They, uh, I recently interviewed them, and they've talked about one of the biggest problems of Bitcoin is the Petro, and the Petro has kind of made everyone think that cryptocurrencies are a scam. So ideally, we don't want nation-state crypto because it's kind of antithetical to Bitcoin. Um, another question, guys, what is... I'm sorry, ladies. What are the challenges that you face in your geography with regards to the expansion of Bitcoin and specifically with regards to education and technology? Um, okay, so, well, I mean, I guess we kind of, um, we cheat a little bit there, right? Because as I said, the premise of my business is that we try not to have to teach people about Bitcoin. Um, so, and, and I have to give a little bit more detail to that answer. So, uh, when I go out into the world, I talk to the owners of these remittance businesses that have, you know, these customers who are migrants and need to send money back home. And I convince those remittance business owners that instead of settling the money that they need to send across borders using US dollars or, or the SWIFT uh, wire transfer system, um, I convinced them to try to use Bitcoin instead. Now, um, if I'm doing my job well, um, I can show them that if they transfer that money using Bitcoin, they can actually save a little bit, or they can make these very granular settlements, um, say, you know, five, ten thousand dollars at a time versus what they were doing before, which is more like five hundred thousand dollars at a time, right? So there's efficiencies to be gained in making these types of very granular settlements. Now, oh, sorry. Now, um, 
uh, because I tend to only speak to these business owners, the customers themselves are not aware of what's going on underneath, right? They only know that very mysteriously, the cost of their average transaction has gone down some percent. And now, if the remittance business owner is savvy, they'll use that to start grabbing more market share, which is kind of what happened in South Korea with us. Um, we were able to kind of very weirdly just start accumulating new customers just by word of mouth because it was basically a fire sale remittance at 50% off, right? So that was kind of how they were pitching it. Now, it worked really well, of course, because everyone just wants cheap remittances. Now, um, does that is that is that better for the uh, the growth of kind of crypto awareness in the region? Maybe not, right? Because the actual end users, the benefactors of this technology, have no idea what's actually happening underneath. Um, but in, I kind of look at it in the same way as you know we use Gmail every day, and I don't I couldn't explain to you how SMTP works, and neither would I want to learn, right? And I think that Bitcoin has a role where it is just that invisible settlement mechanism underneath. It doesn't necessarily have to be the thing that we print on our hoodies. Sorry, Leo, I know that you like doing that. But, <laughs> but like, I, I, I genuinely believe that some technologies are better when they're not sexy, right? Just, just, just keep them kind of uh, invisible and let them stay complicated, you know, and have professionals handle it. Um, but you can have these layers on top of it that make it a little bit more palatable to the average consumer. Uh, which is what we're, we've been trying to do. And it certainly worked to, a, to an extent, and, but I'm not going to lie, there are definitely some advantages to just using this stuff kind of natively, kind of you know, directly, if you can. That is still the superior way to, to benefit from these technologies. But for the average person, the average uh, migrant who earns $400 a month, needs to send back $100 a month, they have neither the time nor the inclination, nor do I think they have to, right? They shouldn't have to. Uh, learn about this stuff. So that's kind of uh, where we're kind of, the, that's the position we've taken with our company. You, he's pretty much said everything about how I think about, uh, I guess, the user base. Um, there are people who need to understand how Bitcoin works and they don't need me to explain that to them. The people who trade on my platform don't need me to tell them what a private key is. They, they know and they seek out this information, but my mom is never going to know what a private key is, but she's going to send money, right? And you know, it's funny because it's like, there's this pressure to um, kind of explain how Bitcoin works and make everyone understand, but no one even knows how money works. Like, no one knows how ATMs work or like wire transfer, I have no idea. Like, I, no one knows how FaceTime works, no one cares, right? It just works. So I agree with him and that is the strategy I'm, I'm chasing, which is building um, infrastructure for people who provide this kind of like user facing um, financial products to just use uh, Bitcoin uh, as the underlying layer or transport and no one needs to know about block confirmations or anything. No one, yeah, it, that's for the experts and it's the experts job to um, kind of like dumb it down as the layers, yeah. You can try and keep it to two minutes. Very much the biggest um, hassle and the biggest uh, barrier for us is investment schemes. Um, so investment schemes come in different forms. A lot of them are altcoins, a lot of them are listed companies. Um, and they can make that relatively difficult for us to explain Bitcoin unless we really push people to use it. Um, so Bitcoin, uh, I can very much testify it exists, it's being used as money, it might not be used by a lot of people, um, but it's used every day and it's used for commerce. Um, I know that also because I use it every day. Um, now, for somebody who um, enters um, the space, for somebody who makes their first research, um, they're very quickly... Um, yeah, they have their attention diverted by um, very well-run schemes um, that will tell them it's like Bitcoin, but, but better and faster and like more secure and backed by the government or backed by this corporation um, or has already 2 billion users. And for somebody who has never used Bitcoin um, and for somebody who might not even think of this new thing as like money, but rather an investment opportunity, it's impossible to tell the difference. And it's impossible for me to explain what that difference is. Um, for so, often people only learn once they want to sell whatever they bought. Um, if they want to sell Bitcoin, they very really quickly realize um, that they can just go to any Bitcoin meetup, a lot of websites, and very quickly get rid of um, what they bought. Um, but if they go into the investment scheme, um, they 
might not be able to do that. And that reflects very poorly on the industry as a whole, because when they entered this, they weren't able to differentiate. And now when they leave this, it all looks like a scam. Um, and I believe 2017 for our community was the turning point when people would no longer enter cryptocurrency and Bitcoin through Bitcoin. They would no longer um, make their first transaction um, in a Bitcoin ecosystem. They would no longer um, come to us and buy 10 US dollars worth of Bitcoin and then immediately buy a, a cup of tea or beer with that, as maybe happened in 2015 and 2016, but rather um, they would they would enter this um, investing a lot of money and um, yeah, <clears throat> leaving with like a very bad taste in their mouth. And that's the biggest barrier for us. We've got about a minute left. Yeah. So I think one thing that's really interesting with adoption of Bitcoin or any cryptocurrencies in India is building for a country which has so many different subcultures. Um, this is a very unique problem to India in that you have so many different states, over 100 different languages, multiple micro communities. How do you build a platform that all of these people across different regions understand? So many different scripts for each of these languages. Um, and this is, I think, one of the biggest barriers in adoption of technology. Um, this is in addition to the RBI ban, which already exists, which makes Bitcoin or crypto look like a negative propaganda. And we have a final closing comment. So um, if you guys are interested in finding out more about how all this stuff works, uh, I wrote a book called Reinventing Remittances with Bitcoin, which you can buy on Amazon uh, for less than the price of a coffee in Norway. Right? How much is it here? Like $17 or something? It's cheaper than that. I think you can buy a car in the UK for less than the price of a coffee here. <laughs> can we just have a warm round of applause for this amazing panel? If you would like to learn more about Bitcoin, I have a podcast called What Bitcoin Did. We're also joined by the amazing Laura Shin, who also has two amazing podcasts called Unchained and Unconfirmed. And even Jimmy Song has a podcast called Off the Chain at the back. So, and we've got one of the best writers in Bitcoin here, Aaron. So there's plenty of people here who can help educate you more. Just uh, go and say hello to them. Thank you. Okay, so what did you make of that? Did you enjoy listening to that panel? It was definitely a very interesting experience for me and it was great to meet a bunch of people in different places around the world and understand how they use Bitcoin. My visit to the Oslo Freedom Forum was also a real life-changing few days. I met so many amazing people and heard all these incredible stories from people, different things they've been through across the world, things I don't experience living in the UK. So for me on a personal level, it's changed my focus. I am now entirely focused on Bitcoin for the What Bitcoin Did podcast, but there is so much other stuff I want to cover. So I do want to avoid all the distractions and fights over different cryptocurrencies. If you are interested in those, there are other podcasts which cover it for you. But for me, I'm just going to focus now on Bitcoin. I'm going to be launching a sister podcast of What Bitcoin Did called The Defiance Podcast, which will focus on topics which align with Bitcoin, from censorship to human rights, sex workers to the drugs war. But it will also feature softer and more approachable shows about Bitcoin because there is a wider, broader group of people I want to target with the show. And by covering topics like this, I can bring a whole bunch of new people into Bitcoin and probably into What Bitcoin Did. So keep an eye out for that. I hope you will enjoy both shows. And I also hope you enjoyed this special What Bitcoin Did show. If you'd like to discuss it with me, then feel free to reach out to me. My email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. And just to let you know, on Tuesday, I've got a really fascinating interview coming out with a quantum physicist discussing the quantum threat to Bitcoin. Okay, hope you have a great week. Speak to you soon. <laughs>